These cables carry electricity from Dungeness Power Station over there. This program is about nuclear power. About a fifth of all the electricity we use in Britain has such a generating source, and in the world, 15% of all electricity has a nuclear source. Nuclear power stations and the electricity they generate are part of a bigger system of energy supply that includes coal and oil. But it's more than an energy supply problem. Many essential everyday things are made from coal and oil. Paints, lubricants, all kinds of plastics, adhesives, detergents, drugs, synthetic fibers such as nylon, cosmetics, and many chemicals. We want to explain how nuclear power stations do their job, the part they play in meeting the needs of our society, to explain how in 30 odd years or so there have evolved many types of nuclear reactor. But that's leaping too far ahead. Before talking about what makes a nuclear power station special, or the different types involved, we need to understand what makes a nuclear power station the same as all the others. All power stations put electricity into the national grid. A network of power lines carries the output of all power stations all over the country to wherever electricity is needed. Electricity is produced here by a machine called an alternator, which simply put is a scaled up bicycle dynamo. A bike might produce about three watts of electricity, whilst machines like these produce 275 million watts, 275 megawatts. The alternator is made to turn by a turbine, which is rather like a fan blown round by a jet of steam. To make steam, you need to boil water, and to boil water, you need heat. To supply a whole city's electricity, that takes a lot of heat. And up to this point, all power stations in this country are the same. It's the source of the heat, the source of the heat that makes the difference. And that's really where the story of nuclear begins. British power stations use the heat from either a coal fire or an oil fire in a furnace, or the heat from a nuclear chain reaction taking place in a reactor. The nuclear reactor, then, is but part of the power station system. But since it is the distinctive part, it is the reactor on which we'll concentrate. Nuclear reactors are not simple devices, and there are many different types, but the basic ideas in their design are simple to understand. What we must first do is describe a basic reactor, show what are the essential parts, and then describe real reactor systems show how the basic theoretical reactor is put into practice. If this program were about cars, we could say cars have basic components, engine, gearbox, steering. If we lifted the bonnets, though, of these cars, we would find that no two were alike. Some have engines that are air-cooled or water-cooled, front engines, rear engines, automatic or manual. What, then, are the basics of a reactor? Firstly, fuel. The fuel for all reactors contains uranium. Uranium atoms are very large. The center of the atom, the nucleus, so large that it will fall apart, split of its own accord. Scientists refer to this as fission. When fission happens, tremendous energy in the form of heat is given out, and the nucleus throws out subatomic, smaller particles, neutrons. Now, if a loose neutron strikes a uranium nucleus, it will cause fission. So fission can occur of its own accord, but it can also be caused by a neutron striking the uranium nucleus. Obviously, since each fission releases neutrons, and neutrons cause fission, fissions cause fissions. That is a chain reaction, a continuous reaction, and a continuous release of heat. This is a rod of uranium. If there were a chain reaction going on in this rod, it would be very hot, dangerous for me to hold. 
there is not enough uranium to start a chain reaction. There has to be a critical amount. If we had many identical rods and brought them close together, then a chain reaction is possible. But possible only with the second essential component of the basic reactor. Neutrons produced by fission travel at speeds of something like 10,000 miles every second. It so happens that neutrons at these speeds cannot cause fissions easily. Slower neutrons are far better. By slow, I mean speeds of 15 miles per second. If the neutrons are slowed down by being bounced off atoms of a substance which will not fission and will not absorb neutrons, then a chain reaction will occur very easily. This gives us the second component of our basic reactor, the neutron slower, the moderator. This surrounds the fuel. Given a critical amount of fuel and a moderator, the chain reaction would proceed, but uncontrolled. So a third basic part of a reactor is a control system to stop and start a reaction as necessary, to control the energy being released. There are some materials which soak up neutrons. They absorb them like sponges absorb water. If rods of neutron absorber are placed in our reactor, they stop the reaction. Our reactor is now working, can be turned on and off, and is capable of producing great heat. This heat has to be carried away out of the reactor so water can be boiled to make steam. So a coolant is pumped around the reactor, it carries away the heat to heat exchangers, where it gives its heat to water, which boils to make steam, to drive the turbines, and so on. This then is the basic nuclear reactor. Fuel, moderator, control system, coolant. Let's look at a real power station. This is called a hole. It's been feeding electricity into the national grid since 1956. It lies really at the very roots of an evolutionary tree of nuclear power generation. And after more than 30 years, it's still working. Let's relate this to our basic reactor. The fuel is metallic uranium. The uranium rods are in cans of magnesium oxide like this. That's what gives this reactor type its name, Magnox. The moderator is graphite. That's pencil lead between you and me. So underneath this floor is a huge layered structure of graphite bricks. On this film of the quarter hole being built, you can see the graphite bricks being laid. And you can see the holes. The holes are for the fuel rods and the control rods. This reactor type was developed from the huge reactors built to provide materials for the weapons program of the Second World War. Then the heat from the reactors was wasted. Air was blown across the reactors to stop them overheating. In these reactors that are adapted for power use, a gas is also used to cool the reactor, and the gas is carbon dioxide. The coolant then passes outside the reactor to heat exchangers which boil the water. From the outside you can see the exchangers, those brightly painted structures on either side. This design, the Magnox, was developed into a full program in the 1960s. Reactors grew in size and power output, the design more sophisticated. The last Magnox, Wilver, in North Wales, has a power output over four times that of Calder. The gas called graphite moderated reactor is one type or family. At the same time in America, another reactor type was evolving. A submarine needs a power plant which requires refueling infrequently. It was realized that a nuclear reactor was ideal for this. What was needed was a very compact unit that was highly efficient. The fuel for these reactors was not uranium metal, but a ceramic uranium oxide. This melts at 2,800 degrees Celsius, whereas uranium metal melts at 1,130 degrees. 
This means that a reactor using ceramic fuel can be allowed to get hotter, making it better at boiling water and so be smaller. The moderator and coolant are the same substance in this reactor, ordinary water. The water in the reactor is at very high pressure, 150 times atmospheric pressure. So it never boils, never turns to steam. It gets very hot, over 300 degrees Celsius, and passes through a heat exchanger where it boils a second lot of water for the turbines. This type is known as a pressurized water reactor, a PWR. Scaled up for power station use, this reactor type has become very successful. One of the reasons for its success is the small size. The reactors can be prefabricated at the factory and then assembled on site. This is a film of one of Bradwell's reactors, a Magnox, under construction. Look at the diameter of the reactor. These are sections through a PWR core of a similar power rated reactor. It's tiny in comparison. I'm in a laboratory run by the Atomic Energy Authority. Here, PWR components are tested, or rather the methods of testing are tested. These components here have faults deliberately planted, and the equipment used for testing real components are set to find these faults. The point is, though, look at the size compared to a Magnox for the same power. So far, we've looked at two lines of reactor development. On the one hand, the British gas-cooled. On the other hand, the American water-cooled. There is a third line, and one that we can't ignore. That reactor type was developed by the Soviet Union. The USSR was also early in the field of nuclear power development. They claim a power reactor operating in 1954. The reactor components take the following form. The fuel is ceramic fuel operating at high temperature. The moderator, graphite. The coolant, water which boils in the reactor. This design is a hybrid combining British and American features and known as the RBMK. The design was studied and rejected by the West. Why? The design is very complicated. The graphite of a moderator is pierced by many pipes holding water at very high pressure, but water that is boiling, turning to steam, and this complicates things very much. The peculiarity of this type of reactor is that under certain conditions, it can run away, out of control. To explain the design faults of an RBMK would take in itself a whole program. But to put it in simple terms, not involving nuclear physics, imagine a car. Imagine in almost every gear the car works perfectly normally, but in one certain gear with the foot lightly on the accelerator, it just speeds forward at maximum acceleration and the brakes fail to do anything. Such an unpredictable car is basically flawed. The RBMK at Chernobyl accelerated, if you like, from a fraction of its full power to 100 times its maximum permitted power in just four seconds. It boiled dry and exploded. The RBMK needed sophisticated control systems to make it safe. Automatic systems which would counter operator error. Chernobyl proved the systems were not there. The existing RBMKs will be fitted with Western systems. No new RBMKs are to be started. The reactor type has reached the end of its line, an evolutionary dead end that can progress no further. It can't compete with other reactor types in terms of safety. It was a 20-year-old unchanged reactor design. Other reactors have changed, evolved. This was called a hall, and this is its descendant, Torness, in Scotland. This power station is being built for the South of Scotland Electricity Board. It's an AGR, an advanced gas cooled reactor. Like a Magnox, it uses carbon dioxide as a coolant and graphite as a moderator. But like the PWR, the fuel is ceramic for increased temperature and efficiency. The heat exchangers have been moved inside the reactor to increase efficiency. The output of this station will be 1200 megawatts. Work here is progressing to finish the station. There are six AGR stations in Britain, two of which are under construction. Technology in the UK has developed Elsewhere, the PWR design has gone from strength to strength. 
Perhaps one of the most successful users of PWRs is France. Electricity to France generates 70% of its power from nuclear stations. I'm at Gravelines, that's in northern France and quite near Dunkirk. The power station here is massive. Each one of those domes holds a 900 megawatt PWR. So in total, the six of them, that's 5,400 million watts of power. Is high technology, not easily understood and perhaps easy to fear. In the 30 years since we first began using nuclear electricity, over 400 reactors have been built. Many power stations have more than one reactor. Calder Hall has four, Graveline has six. And that's 400 that you don't hear much about because they're simply getting on with the job. Matching the continually growing demand for electricity with supplies that are cheap and safe is essential for every country and every society in the world. It's a problem which will grow in the coming years. Nuclear power is not the solution, no one thing is that, but it is an essential part of the answer to that demand.